Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized. Welcome to the Chris Hedges Report. The United States has 25% of the world's prison population, some 2.3 million people, most of whom are poor, although it represents less than 5% of the global population. Its prisons are notorious for their violence, overcrowding, and human rights abuses, including the widespread use of solitary confinement. But what is often not examined is what happens to those released from prisons into a society where they face legalized discrimination imposed by numerous laws, rules, and policies that result in permanent marginalization, thrusting them into a criminal caste system. These former prisoners are often denied the right to vote, can lose their passports, are barred from receiving public assistance, including housing, and blocked from a variety of jobs. They must often repay exorbitant fines, abide by arbitrary rules imposed by probation officers, and avoid committing even minor criminal offenses, or they go back to prison. The hurdles placed before them are momentous and help explain why within five years, a staggering 76% return to prison. Today, in the first of a two-part series called A Long Road Home, we look at what happens to those in the United States who leave prison and struggle to re-enter society through the eyes of five former prisoners, all of whom I taught in the college degree program offered by Rutgers University in the New Jersey prison system, and who collectively spent 119 years in prison. When they say 30 to life, you realize your child is being locked up for 30 years or the rest of his life. So how do you deal with that? Our prayer was that uh, at Christmas time, he'll be home. And each year, we just believed at Christ by Christmas time, he'll be home. You know, even this past Christmas. <laughs> and we were able to hold on to that, believing that one day he would be home for the next Christmas. Russ Owen, an Army veteran, after 32 years, is released from East Jersey State Prison in Rahway, New Jersey. He is greeted by his father, mother, daughter, grandchildren, and friends. He walks from the prison to the Quick Check, a ritual for freed prisoners who can see the convenience store from their barred windows, and engages in the familiar rite of stuffing his prison issue clothes in the trash. As well as buying a few items in the store. But release is only the beginning of a journey that will end with three quarters of all released prisoners back in prison. While this is a day of joy and celebration for Russ, two years after being released following a 16-year sentence, Robert Luma, whose nickname is Kabir, is still struggling to find housing. He lived for a time in a homeless shelter and steady employment. It's difficult, very, very, very difficult. And really there's no organization to support ex-offenders. And that's kind of like where we get put in the hole. Like, like if you don't have your own social connections and things of that nature, then you're going to be done for. And a lot of guys who do a lot of time, as of myself and more, they don't have those connections because they've been gone for so long. So when you look back on the whole period since you were released, uh, what have been the hardest moments that you've had to deal with? I would say like right before the pandemic, when I was in the shelter, those are the hardest moments. Because a lot of times I did not want to be there. Like, and I had to like maybe go spend a night out and I might be with my friend and they want to go in and I might be like try to convince them to stay out more because I don't want to go back there. Explain to people why it's so hard to get an apartment. Because for one, they want to know about your background check, your credit score, your eviction history. So they basically want to, and I understand that, they want to see what type of person they're putting in their property. 
Now, a person like myself, I might have to explain I've been in prison for 16 years and most people would not have you as an attendant. So that is a barrier that is kind of hard and difficult to climb. And Whole Foods, talk about that. What oh happened? yeah, I was at Whole Foods. This was two days before they actually called it the pandemic and I was working there from March to August. That whole period of time, the courts was shut down. So when they do the background check, the courts was closed, so there's no way they could do a background check. Once the courts reopened and they did my background check, they got rid of me. But it is not only the physical impediments that make re-entry difficult, but the emotional and psychological ones. And, and, and so Ron Pierce, a Marine Corps veteran, explains what it was like to return to society after three decades, in his case, to Rutgers University, where he completed the college degree he had begun in prison, graduating summa cum laude. I was in a college class, and, and I, was, I was talking to, to somebody about, about the class, and we were walking. Now, at the time, I was in a halfway back program, so I had to, I had to stop in, in to, to the uh, NJ Step office, or the Mountain View office. And so when we got to where I had to go, she was busy still talking, and because, you know, prison mind, you get to your wing, you turn and you go, you know. I did that and she looked at me and, and I was like, well, I, I have to go in here and I, I just went in. But it was really, I talked to people in, in, in the office and I said, I felt really bad, like I was being rude. And they were saying, yeah, you were being rude. So I went and I tried to, and I apologized to her next class. And I said, look, I'm sorry, I was, I was being rude. I'm, I, I am just trying to reacclimate. Uh, back into society. She said, oh, it's not a problem. I said, I said, yeah, it is. And, and I was rude and I want to apologize. So she accepted my apology and she started talking to me again. But class had started. Now you got to sit down in, in class in, in the prison society. So I, I just abruptly got up and, and went right in the middle of her sentence, got up and, and went to, to sit down. Now, Somebody in prison would have understood, hey, we all, we all have to sit down. She didn't. She looked at me and never spoke to me again. So you're, you're used to that punishment mentality, and you, you have to break that and, 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 and reacclimate you back to society, to a society that's more free to a degree. But isn't it also any emotion that exposes vulnerability, uh, grief, depression, weeping, all of that stuff is not something that uh, many people within a prison will uh, share with the others. Is that well, correct? Well, it's not that they won't. It's just you can't. It's not, it's not the space for it. You can't show grief. You, you can't show fear. You, you, you can't show sensibil uh, sensitivity. You can't show any of those emotions. If you do, it could be perceived as weakness. And, 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 and as I said earlier, the perception of, of being, being a dangerous person has to, comes with that. So no, you repress all your emotions. You don't express your emotions. And if you don't express your emotions, when you come out, you're not, you're not equipped to, to understand your own emotions, let alone be able to express them. Thomas Dollar, who spent 30 years in prison, said that six months after his release, he too struggles to cope. I dream that I'm still there, you know. Like, I dream that they're calling, mess out. I wake up like, mess out, you know. And I'm getting ready to literally get up to go start preparing for mess. Uh, why wow, so many things? Uh, Dealing, even, you know, uh, my wife sometimes has to say to me, like, why didn't you, why you not sleep? Because I'm used to sleeping light because people moving around me, waiting for the police to come hit my bed to wake me up and say, you got to get up or you got to wake up so I can see you move. Uh, I still deal with these things now, you know. Uh, This, you know, sometimes people say that, you know, I want to be free, I want to be free. 
But after being caged up so long, sometimes you say to yourself, am I really free? You know, I know I'm on parole. That's not free. You know, I'm still what I look at as being a slave because I can't go anywhere I want. I have to ask permission. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 51 years old, but I feel like I'm somebody's child. You know, my parole officer is at least 20 years younger than me, you know, and when I'm going to him, I have to ask him, I have to text him and tell him I want to go here or I can't even spend the night anywhere. You know, these things are like being in prison. Those in prison carry the trauma they endured in prison with them when they leave. The emotional numbness they needed to cope on the inside, the ever-present threat of violence, the military-like regime where they are ordered about, made to march in single lines, thrown into isolation for minor infractions, locked in cages the size of bathrooms, and forced to obey the whims of corrections officers. These experiences and the conditioning they engender are not easily discarded, as Boris Franklin, who was in prison for 11 years, explained. Well, one thing I learned when I got in prison, I had never heard more excuse me and pardon me, and because immediately you have to let the individual know that I don't have a problem with you. So being rude in a prison comes at a different cost, especially in the maximum security prison, in this hyper-masculine space. I seen a guy stab a guy in the yard and he died. I watched it. Did I think that I would see this day? No, I got cut in my face by somebody who was mad at somebody that I was close with. You know, every day when you wake up and you're in a situation like that and you're caged in, you don't see no way out. And you know, when people are rushing the hustle and bustle or getting on the buses when we were going to, um, to Rutgers, they don't say excuse me. So you don't know if, you, so my, my knee-jerk response is to respond to that disrespect in the way in which I might have responded in that prison space, right? I mean, you were there when I came home and I was so socially awkward I sat next to Chris at my first family outing, and I couldn't order off an IHOP menu because choices were overwhelming. I, I wasn't used to choices. We had a limited amount of choices. So your senses just get overwhelmed with everything. I couldn't nail down the timing for crossing the street. I never thought that would be a problem. I hadn't crossed the street in so long, I couldn't time the cars. I'll be sitting there just waiting for no traffic to come out. You have stores everywhere, you know. It's, this has been, whew. This was a culture shock for me, coming back to a world that I really had no idea. You could think, and when you're on the inside, you think you know what the world is like out here. Trust me, you have absolutely no idea. And then when I went places, I felt like even if I was in a place where nobody knew me, I felt like I was sitting in a room with a prison uniform on with DOC on the back of it. And everyone knew I had just gotten out of prison. But I didn't know there would be this storm of emotions going on inside of me that people could not see. That this anxiety that people could not see. That I was always under this pressure, which makes you want to leave. And then you get to the point to where as though to be outside at night, I always felt like I was running back home because I was out of place. I'm supposed to be locked down at this time. I'm usually locked in a cell. And I remember I used to just have to stay out later and go further, just drive a little further. Something as small as breaking a rule, right? Like throwing something out of a window. I was so afraid to do anything for a long period of time that I had put myself in such a box. When you hear a knock on the door, you fear that that's the day that the police are coming to say, come on, we're taking you back, you know? And you know you've done nothing, but you've seen people go back for nothing. And another thing I was afraid to express, I was afraid to express, express anger because of what it, the cost, you know? Um, and the first time I expressed anger was against my brother. And my older brother said, there's a lot of stuff buried in there it came out in a very unhealthy way in which I had to go back to him and I had to apologize to him. But you, you learn to choke back your anger so much because an officer could disrespect you 
and it costs you to say something back. It costs you to defend yourself. All of that comes at a cost. So you just, you just become a shell of yourself and you shrink a little bit. And you have to figure out how can I assert myself in this world and, and not be afraid that I'm gonna make a social mistake and it's gonna come at a cost, right? And so I live trapped in that box. And another thing that I had, I couldn't ride in, the, I, I couldn't ride in an elevator. Because you know the cage coming out of the mess hall? I got trapped in the cage. And I didn't know I had any trauma, but one day I was going to the cage and I felt my underarm sweating. And I was trying to figure out why am I sweating? And the closer I got to the cage, my heart started beating. And I realized that that day we got locked in the cage had traumatized me. Having this, this, this trauma, we got trapped in the elevator in New York. You remember that? Yeah, I was with you. Yeah, and inside, my, I was freaking out. I mean, and I mean, we got trapped in an elevator in New York where the, uh, the fire department has to show up. Inside, I don't know, if I didn't worry about someone else, truthfully, I worried about you and took my mind off of it. <laughs> because I was like, I don't want Chris to freak out. I didn't want anybody to freak out because if, if anybody lost it, I was done for. It, it was just going to be a, a snowball effect. Because my, my knee-jerk response, I just wanted to get on the ground. And just and just ball up. I just wanted to get on the ground and ball up. Let me say that in this way, things change as far as the people around you. Some for guys who you've been with in prison for years, they don't want you to go. And some of the other people that are that are jealous that you're seeing something that they're not seeing. And I have I have I have a life sentence. And a lot of the guys that I've dealt with over the years have life sentences. So for one of us to go home is rare. We don't expect to walk out those doors when they say life. They said 30 years to life for us. We don't look at the 30 years, we look at the life aspect. And some of us decided that we were going to do things inside the prison that, uh, that will harm them when they have to go to the parole board because they didn't look at this day. Like when I first got sentenced, I couldn't see 30 years in prison. Can I even, I'm 21 years old, I haven't even lived for 30 years. Once that 30 years was up, it became something different. Like, wow, I can actually see uh, on my way out. Sometimes you can't see no way out. And that hole is so small that you're trying to dig your way out of it, but you're staying in your own way. You have to depend on yourself or a few good comrades. And, but friendship, I can be friends with these guys, but they're flighty too because some of them get paroled. And each time a guy leaves, he, he, he'll take a part of you because this is the guy you did three years with of a very hard space. And he, he helped make you laugh. And he helped, you know, talked about sports and whatever we, we experienced our life together and then he's gone. And now I got no one. I got to find another guy to bond with. And it's like, how many times can you do this? How many people are going to keep leaving me? And to the point, you just... making promises. Yeah, yeah. Then they make the promises as to, you know, I'll write you when I get out. I'll send you something. And then they, somebody will ask you, hey, have you heard from Ron? You're like, nah, I ain't heard from him. Well, you know how they do once they get out there. And, you know, so... All of those things, man, it's not just the anger, it's, it's everything. To become a complete person again, it takes time. Kabir also described a similar difficulty in adjusting. Well, for one, you're not socialized. And psychologically, like when I got out, I still was in prison mode. Like I was uptight. Everybody that walked past me, I had to look at them. Like I gotta, and even sometimes I still do that. I gotta know who's around me. As much as I can, like, I gotta take it into my environment because you never know what's gonna happen. So I was on security mode. I had a girlfriend when I got out and we used to go places and she used to be like, well, why are you looking at her? I was like, I'm not only looking at her, I'm looking at the kid that walked past me, I'm looking at the dude over here in the car. Like, you just, what well, we consider being on point. And that was one of the things that we want to consider the bad habit or maybe a safety mechanism. Just getting approved for release is a hurdle, even if prisoners have completed their mandatory sentences. I sat down a few days after Russ was released with him, Ron, and Boris 
to discuss why so many people who are eligible are denied parole. So the first hurdle for getting out is going before the parole board, and it is a hurdle, and a lot of people don't make it. Uh, so, uh, Boris, you didn't go before a parole board, but both uh, Russ, you and Ron did. Why don't you begin, Russ, and just tell us uh, how it's set up and how difficult it is to get through a parole board after you've done your time. Uh, when I went before the panel, it was two people. And as I mentioned before, you know, I went in there and somebody was in there that was in previous to me. And there was some complications with that. The guy stormed out and then they made him go back in. So by the time I got in there, uh, you know, they asked me like, what my name is, what my number is. And you could tell that they weren't prepared because right then and there, they were trying to read my case. And, you know, my crime involved a knife. And the guy asked me, so where'd you get the gun from? You know, so it started off rocky and, and it was all, it's already an intimidating process. And I was already intimidated, you know, so that made me even more, more anxiety filled me up. And, uh, you know, so it was just, it, and it was aggressive. You know, they questioned me about my education and, and it wasn't like, good job. It was, how did you get this education? Uh, and then, you know, I had caught a couple charges. So, you know, minor charges. And I never did a time in the hole. I never did ad seg. And, but they were uh, aggressive with the charges. And I was only in there for 15 minutes. And I got up and I left and I just couldn't, I couldn't believe. I'm like, what just happened? You know, uh, and I thought it was a dream. And the guy told me to take more programs, and I couldn't believe he told me to take more programs because I felt like I took every program already. There are certain rules that when you go before a parole board, you have to fulfill. So Gene Berta, uh, has, he's been in almost 40 years, I think. He keeps going before the parole board, and th they ask him to express remorse for his crime, and he says he did not commit the crime, and he won't express remorse for something he didn't do, and therefore he's thrown right out the door and he's denied parole. I want to talk about when you go before that board, they are, have whatever you were incarcerated for three decades plus earlier, they go through that with excruciating detail and there are all sorts of traps that they set up. Uh, and if you're not uh, very deft about handling how you speak about that crime, uh, you're sent right back. So maybe begin, Russ, and you, Ron, talk about that, uh, uh, that process. Well, for them, you know, you might have an idea in your head of, of what really happened. And what really happened might even be true. But they already have your narrative because you went to trial or you pled guilt. Whatever it is that happened, they have the narrative on you. They wrote the narrative on you. So the trap is that you can't go in there and change the narrative. On paper, you're guilty. So you can't go, it's not a guilt or innocence process. You know, for them, you're already, you're already judged guilty. So when you go in there and you start arguing the facts of the case, no, well, that didn't happen, this happened, they don't want to hear that. You know, if, if, if it says that you shot somebody seven times or stabbed somebody seven times, that's what it is. So if you go in there and say, no, that's not what happened, that's already the trap. And once you start, once you start uh, fighting back or trying to put in your own narrative, I think it's downhill from even there. Even if it's true. Even if it's true. You know, for, even for me, it was a lot of things that came up that wasn't true. But you got to play the game. If you don't play the game, if you can see what's going on with Gene and, and so many others, you get caught in that cycle and you're not saying what they want to hear, unfortunately. But there's also, it's not just about facts. There are all sorts of psychological uh, um, s states <clears throat> that they want you to have attained in order to be released. And if you're not very attuned to what they're looking for, uh, however innocent and truthful and well-meaning, uh, you're finished. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned uh, remorse, and that came up one in a, one in a parole, up, uh, parole panel told me after I went through the whole panel and talked to everybody, then it comes back and they ask you questions on the way back. They said, in all this process, I haven't heard you say anything that, that mean, leaves me to believe you're remorseful. Now, that, that in itself is a trap because he's trying to make you 
to, to go off and, and, and lose focus of who you are. So my answer to him, I think, helped me uh, immensely in that I, I relayed to him not only what I'm sorry that, that you don't, didn't hear remorse in my, my narrative, but I'm, I'm remorseful for not only for, for what I did to, to this man, but, but for how I took his choices away from him from that day to this day, how I took from his family uh, the very dynamic that they can never get back. And, and I went through the process of how I, I was remorseful for the, the, the good he could have done for any community from that day to then, and how I was even remorseful you know, for, for what I did to my family. My family has a hole in it. So by answering that, you could see his face change. And when they get a hit, they assign, they say there's a certain number of years before you can come back. Yeah. And some of those hits have been, am I right, up to 10 years? Uh, the worst I've heard was 60, but I think the- 60 the, years. 60 you years. You can't come back for 60 uh, years. Was Steve Perry. Was, yeah, Steve Perry got 60 year hit. The court changed it to 15, but he had, the parole board gave him 60. But you know, the problem with that is like, I, I did go to parole once, so in a, as a short termer, right? And when you go on a short term, you can very much remember the crime. I hadn't moved that far from it. But when you're doing long sentences, first when you go in, there's a depression because of everything that you've done, everything that you've lost, your children, your family, and the fact that you've committed this crime. So you spend all of these years trying to come out of this depression and get past that place. And now someone wants you to go back into that space in order to get your parole, which is problematic because now you have to relive the trauma. You know, because, and, and I say this because the prison had approached me to do some programs for them. Uh, they thought I would be good for the programs to get grants. So they, they wanted to put me in the program so when Trenton come, they had to focus on the victim program, right? And they came to me and they said, well, could you, could you get in that program? And then when Trenton comes, could you talk? And I said, first of all, I couldn't do focus on the victim because I thought it was a bad idea. Because so many individuals were still seeing themselves as victims of their communities, of the systems, of all the social ills that, and by then they had done enough reading to realize they had done something to someone and they were remorseful, but then they also were aware of what the system had done to them, which, which made some tension there. And that's what you walk into the room with, because now what you have to be essentially is when you walk into a, a parole meeting as an actor. When you go to classification, you have to be an actor. Would it be, would it be correct, Boris, to say that if you came in and attempted in any way to talk about your own victimhood, however real, that would pretty much destroy your capacity yeah. to get parole? You're done. You're done. I, I, they don't want to hear you being a victim. Join me next week for part two of The Long Road Home, where we examine the effects of mass incarceration on families, the criminal caste system, and the struggle by those who are released to reintegrate into American society.